This morning I'd ask you to turn to the book of Exodus chapter 2, Exodus chapter 2. Uh, as you're turning there, and probably most of you have seen this, but I noticed it on the internet last night, <coughs> the, cur the current Pope of the Catholic Church has uh, said that sodomy is yeah. And I'm sure that a lot of uh, people within that group will be marrying and all that good stuff, but uh, he is the Pope that has really united things and said, hey, everything's okay. And he's a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. And you watch peacemakers. Mm -hmm. It's fine not to go looking for a fight, but you better stand for what you know. Right. And uh, so, uh, I thought very interesting um, connection there. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 11. Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days, when Moses was grown, that he went out to his brethren, and he looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way and that way, and when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together, and he said unto him, What did the wrong, I mean, excuse me, and he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedest the Egyptian? And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now Pharaoh heard this thing, and he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. And when they came to Reuel, Reuel when, and when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, Now, how is it that thou hast come so soon this day? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and, and where is he? Why is it that you have left him, left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zipporah his daughter. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we pray that you would meet with us this morning. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts with your word. Lord, that you would stir us up as a people together. Lord, make us mindful always of your word and uh, where uh, it should lie and what's important to us. God, now we pray that you would send the Holy Ghost this way and that you would uh, strengthen uh, our souls. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, maybe some not so familiar scripture, but many do uh, know the days of Moses fleeing, uh, but sometimes we really don't understand what got him there and uh, how he came to the state that he got in. Now, uh, it says that he came to pass in those days when Moses was grown. Now, in the book of Hebrews, I think it's chapter 12, it said that Moses reached a certain age and refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. Now, uh, he was giving up a lot with that, and, and he had set a lot of things aside. And <clears throat> But remember this, and this is my, my understanding of Moses' life. Moses was still lost. He had done a lot of great things, and he had uh, kind of protected the people of God, but Moses was lost. And you know what I have found? Lost people act like lost people and you can't uh, and you can say they're saved but that don't make it so right. you know the very best thing we can do when it comes to our children or parents just whatever is to be honest uh, don't, don't say something there is there when you know it's not and so we find soon at 
family. Moses was a good man. He refused to be called the daughter, I mean, the son of Pharaoh. And on the surface, that all seems good. Now, verse, uh, reading on in verse 11, and it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Now, the way that I take this, that it literally was one of his brothers, not, not just a member, not just a Jewish person, it could well have been Aaron. And, and he, he was the one involved in this confrontation. And you know, me and Judy fought like cats and dogs when we were kids, but you let someone say something to the other one of us, and we got together like that, and we were ready for the fight. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that was the thing uh, that was going on here, is that he was just trying to protect Aaron or one of his other brethren. And the reason I say that, you know, when he was first discovered by the Egyptian princess, uh, Miriam, his sister, was right there. So he knew who these people were. And when he actually returned from Midian, he, uh, he saw Aaron and recognized him and went to him, even though it had been 40 years. And so he understood who this was. But he reacted just like a lost person. And he looked this way and that way. Isn't that just like the flesh looking around? Okay, nobody's seeing me. So I'm going to do what I want to. I'm going to, I'm going to follow through with this thing. You know, that's a, song, a false assurance that your flesh will give you that nobody's watching. Now, we find out obviously somebody was watching. But you know, even if you think you get away with it, you have it. it it'll come back to haunt you. It, 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 will, it will be a, a thorn in your flesh from then on. And so we find that... Uh, Moses proceeds with what he's about to do. And he looked this way and that way. And when he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Now, he killed another person. And, and I understand, you look at David. David was a saved man. And he killed many, many people. But what I'm saying is this. Moses was presenting as a lost person. And he was pretending to be something that he wasn't. You know, we do that a whole lot. You know what? I'm very fearful in the modern day, and I'm not talking about just so-called churches. I mean churches of the living God. What you've got is a bunch of lost people tied, tied together. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find then that Moses was doing exactly what his heart and his, and his, uh, his flesh was telling him to do. He was acting like who he was. Verse 13, and he went out the second day and he told two men of the Hebrews strove together. Now it's not an Egyptian and a Hebrew, Aaron, whoever he was. It's two Hebrews, two, two of his, uh, his nation people. And he said unto them, and he said unto him that did, his, that did the wrong, wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, who made, made thee a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killedest the Egyptian? So I want you to see that uh, uh, he wasn't alone. Somebody did see him. Somebody beheld the whole event, and now it's becoming public news. Now, I can't, I, I can't really understand. I don't think it was that this was the very one that saw him because there was already two people there and both of them knew it. And, and so we find that sin that is all uh, consuming, you know, don't convince yourself that someone's saved. You know who is the only person that knows they're saved? That's that person. That is the only yeah. thing that you can come to. And, and, and so we find then that Moses gets scared. And Moses feared and said, surely this thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. Now, if you remember, probably there was still a little contention, because remember, he was refused to be called the son of Pharaoh. And you know what? Now he had an opportunity to get back. Now he had an opportunity. You know, I'll say this. The world is looking at you constantly Find, trying to find something to pick out. To look in one little 
thing that you can do. And see, now the whole situation was turned around, and even his own uh, adopted father was after him. Yeah. And you know what? The world is going to follow you, and the world's going to look at you, and the world's going to come after you, because that's what it does <laughs> to uh, really each other if you let it go. <laughs> And the Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, but Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, everybody gets into this thing, and we're going to look at it very closely. Listen, despite what was habit happening, Midian wasn't the place of God's people. Uh, I studied this out, and you know what the Midianites were? They were the precursors of the Baals. They, they were people that would grow into that religion uh, of Baal where they, they bowed before him and, and offered even their children to him. You know what? Even if he wasn't lost, he had no business there. You know what? Our children have no business learning the methods of this world. They belong here. They belong in this place. You know what? If one of mine said, and I don't guess it happened, uh, I can't remember, but one of mine said, can I go over to my friends, we'll go to church on Sunday, they're Methodists. I'd say, no, sir. I guess you can go over, but I'll, I'll be there about eight to pick you up. You see what I'm saying? Uh, we don't need that influence, and every day we allow, our, allow us to be influenced and influenced and influenced more by the word, the world. Where are we going to draw the line? Where are we going to say enough's enough? And so we see that like most lost people, Moses made a horrible mistake and went down to Midian. Now, uh, in verse 16, it says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. Now, not only was this just an individual that lived in media, in, in uh, uh, media, it was, I mean, in media, it was the very priest of the place. You know, uh, it's bad enough to get hooked up with the world, but when you get hooked up with the preacher of that filthy place, you've made a big mistake. And you know, uh, you know what Moses was doing? He was acting just like a lost person. And you know what? Lost people have no spiritual discernment at all. It made perfect sense for Moses to go in with them. And you know why? His nature had never been changed. Man, it sounded good, didn't it? I refuse to be called the Pharaoh. I want my own people. Man, don't that sound wholesome? It may sound wholesome, but listen, it didn't make him saved, did it? Uh, it sounds wholesome to wear dresses all the time, but it don't make you say Now, I'm not recommending that you don't. That's what the Bible teaches. But I'm just saying, you can look the part and not have the heart. You see what I'm saying? And so we find then uh, that this was that such of a man, and now he's taken up with non-believers, and more than just non-believers, he's taken up with a bait, or what would someday be the bait to the priest of Midian, <coughs> Now the priests of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered the flock. Now when they came to Raul, their father, he said, How is it that you are come so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian. Now, I want you to notice, and I always thought this is very significant. You know, an Egyptian, Adam knows much more about this than me, but he really liked to study Pharaohs and uh, the history of Egypt when he was a kid. Now, you know how he was identified? By what he was wearing. Because the Egyptians dressed one way, and the Hebrews dressed for another way. Most uh, Egyptian men just had like a little cloth tied right here and they had their headdress and that was it. And, and if you don't believe that, remember whenever uh, Joseph went down to Egypt, you know why his, father, his brethren didn't recognize him? He looked like an Egyptian. And, and so you know what? I think one of the big problems today is blending in, looking like the Egyptians. 
looking, looking what, like everybody that's around us and content to do so. And, and so we find then that he gets here and she immediately says, oh, that's an Egyptian. And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and so grew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? And his daughters wasn't being hospitable. And, and where is he? Why have you let, have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Now, we find the really beginning drive of being okay in Midian, and that was something to eat. You know, our gut will drive us to things you don't think it will. Now, the gut is the primary, but, but there's other, you know, what I found, the older I get, is this. You can't satisfy this flesh. If you get a Corvette, you won't take if you get a three-bedroom house, you'll want a four-bedroom. And on and on. This flesh is impossible to please. Uh, it never, ever gets enough. And so we find Moses wandering out in the wilderness, and all he's offered is a piece of bread to go down to the Midian priest's house. And you know what? Because he was lost and because he was hungry, he took it. And you know, uh, don't get down on Moses. Because I've seen saved people do the same thing. Give up their life for this, for things, for things. And, and so we find then that Moses goes right, uh, right with them back to their father's house. And it gets worse. And Moses was content. Now, church, that's one of the most dangerous places you'll ever be, is to be content. Don't be content. He went down there. He got him some bread. He started being a shepherd for old, uh, his daddy-in-law. He got him a woman for her. And he was content. See, God's people do not need to be content in this world. Right. But boy, we are. You know, uh, a few weeks ago when I went and preached that meeting up in Ohio, I'm coming back and the plane got in kind of a mess. You know, I found in the middle of that, I was content. I was exactly where God wanted me to be. And if it hit the side of the Great Smoky Mountains, all I know is it's going to hit the side of the Great Smoky Mountains. See, we need to get to the point we're content. Not with the things we got, not in the world that we have, but in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only contentment a, a safe person can have. You'll never satisfy this flesh. It's an impossibility to do so. And so we find that Moses gets content in an unholy, ungodly land. He finds himself content. Why? Because his flesh is ruling him. His flesh is in control. And so he finds himself content. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses, and he gave Mo Moses Zipporah, his daughter, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Gershon. Now, I want you to notice one more thing, that this contentment lasted a long, long time. Now, uh, best I understand, he was 80 when he got back to lead the children out. Man, we can be content for a long, long time, can't we? It's easier to sit on the porch than knock on doors. It's easier to feed that gut than, than get out. Sunday, you know, me and Jared was uh, reading the le uh, weather and it's supposed to be 62 and sunny. It's sunny on, on Saturday. Well, that's the same thing except for warmer. They said, out, they said yesterday and Jared and I were out there picking up branches in the rain. You see what I'm saying? So if it's uncomfortable, are you going to go? If it's cold, well, if it's 30 that day. See, we, we need to get where we're not content and we're not comfortable and we're serving the Lord Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> so you think about the things that get you content 
and, and you, you really need to evaluate it. Or, or do they belong to the Lord or do they belong to the world? What makes you content? What makes you comfortable in the last, in, in the days in which we live? Now, I'll say this and we're going to move on. Uh, he had that boy and all those 40 years, I'm assuming maybe even more than that. I don't know how old he was when he got down there. Some people say 40. And uh, how do you think he raised that boy up? I believe he raised him up as a Midian knight, don't you? I mean, Grandpa Midian was up there at his Baylor's temple. And you know what? I don't know what day they meet, but I bet they were up there every time it was meeting time. And, and you know why he did that? He was content. Now you say, oh, I would never, ever raise my, my children up to do this or that. Listen, you don't know what you'll do. When it comes, and you know, I say that myself, and you know, you get back, well, I would never do that. Listen, you look down at them little grandbabies, and, and they don't have nothing to eat. You don't know what you'll do. You see what I'm saying? But Moses had fully compromised. He didn't care. And why? Because he was lost. He had no, he uh, had, uh, he had no drive. Now, and we're not going to read it today for time's sake, but you know, in, in chapter 3, he has an experience that he knew God. And I think I preached this before, and I was almost going to preach it today, but the Lord wouldn't let me do it. But you know, at the beginning, he said, how can I look upon God? He, he was scared. And, and, and the Lord told him, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. And he said, and he was scared, for he dared not look on the face of God. But by the end of it, remember, as he was getting close to the end of life, he said, just let me see it. Just, just let me get a good look. And he said, Moses, no man can see me and live. You know what? You know how that turnabout was made? Step by step. Trusting God. Going in and saying, now Pharaoh, you need to let us go. Threw that rod down and it became a snake. <laughs> Remember that? But you know what else happened that day? You don't hear this in many sermons. Egyptians people did the very same thing. They repeated the miracle. So, but he learned to try. And, and you know, this had to be a little bit of the beginning. His snake gobbled up the other ones. Yeah. See, you learn trust point by point. You're not going to get to the point of depending on the Lord for everything in two days. Right. It takes time. And, and so we find that Moses did get out of this, but I want you to see that he was content to the Lord to, to the time that the Lord saved him. And, and I ask you, what environment to you brings contentment? Now, most of us are not honest, but I'm going to be honest this morning. A lot of time, I'm content doing this. Uh, Donna has, I don't know, one of them here, earbud things. It's not really earbuds. I know she tells I can't even know use it. But anyway, she can hear it. Nobody else can. And you know what? Most of the time, she's pretty content to do that. Uh, now she she is one of those people that can multitask. I'm not very, but she's cooking all these things and baking good food and all the time watching that too. You see what I'm saying? It can consume our time, can it not? It, it can consume what we're doing. And you know what? It's very very content to be there. It's very content to just sit around. After after I got done with helping Jared yesterday, I went down to Mother's. Checked on her, came back, uh, came back up here, and and then went home, and I was exhausted. And you know, of course, everybody gets tired, but a lot of times I think what it is is we're so content with doing nothing that when we do this much, we're like, oh, what am I going to do? So what can, what makes you content today? Is it being with the people of God? Is it sitting in your rocking chair? What makes you content? And if those things that are making you content, do they belong to God or do they belong to you? Is it something the Lord would be pleased with or is it something that's satisfying to the flesh? And see, I have found more and more as I grow older, 
through that the things that I'm most content with is probably not the things that are well pleasing unto the Lord. And so we can see it's very easy to get to get content. Now, Joshua chapter 7. Um, Joshua chapter 7. We're going to begin reading the very first verse, very familiar verses of Scripture. Um, Joshua chapter 7, the first verse, the Bible says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan. And the, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So Achan took it, and God got mad at all of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Bethlehem, Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let only two or three thousand men to go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. Now, what, what was God's plan? To defeat any city that they come up against, what was God's plan? Every one of the men, I think from 21 to 40, was to be out there and to be fighting. And I want you to see that how they, you know what, you don't need to assess the problem. That, that's one of our big, oh, I mean, Ai's just, I mean, it's like bogus mills. We got this. You know what, it's not, your, it's not your place to assess the problem that belongs to God. And, and, and so we find then what led to them is a bunch of people, and I can't remember the exact number, but I think there was like something like 200,000 uh, men that fit in the category of warriors. And they said, oh, well, two or three thousand of them get this. Listen, don't be disobedient to God. You know what? You don't even have to understand why he says it. Uh, you know, I've heard men say that when they're preaching. You'll get in and just understand the, the, the precept. No. You know, I don't understand everything what the Bible says, but I certainly have faith to believe it. You, you don't have to have a, a vivid explanation. In fact, that's where faith begins, is when you don't exactly know why it is that way. And so we find then that the children of Israel made a really big mistake. Verse 4, so they went up thither, and I, will want, you to note, I want you to notice Joshua did not intervene. And so they went up thither, the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote them, about 36 men, and chased them from before the gate even to Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and came as water. Now notice this. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell on the earth upon the face of before the ark of the Lord until evening died, evening tide, he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their head. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, where have thou hast thou brought, wherefore thou hast brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we would have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. Now Again, two things. It shows mankind's desire always to be content. Now, I've never been in the army. Uh, they wouldn't take me. <laughs> and, uh, but I do know this. Out in, out in war, it has to get fatiguing. And if your legs are hurting and, you know, your back's hurting, and, uh, well, you know, it don't take that many to go take this little city. I'm going to just kick back. You know what? We've had far, far too long and far, far too many people just kicking back. Just taking it easy. Well, you know what that gets into? 
uh, it, uh, it destroyed their army. Well, it destroyed 3,000 of them. So I ask you, are you content in the right things? Now, there's nothing wrong with being relaxed if you're relaxed and content in the right things. But what I see in the modern day is that we're much, much too content in the wrong things. We're, we're not content uh, preaching the Word of God. We're not content knocking on doors and, and presenting the Gospel to anybody that we can find. We're content to be on the Internet and we're content to watch TV and we're content to be at work and to, you know, that's not content, the, the contentment that God gives. Everybody all tore up about the election. You know what? Great contentment comes from just trusting God because he's the one that is able to fix the problem. And so where does your contentment come from? Gospel of Mark chapter 15. Mark 15, in the first verse. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests had a, had a consultation, and the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him. Uh, that's not the verse I wanted to read. I'm sorry. Let me look one more place. Well, let's go on to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Now, I've heard this preached on many times, but usually the preaching begins with verse 13, the one most of us can quote. Uh, but I want you to see that uh, in verse 11, I'm sorry, it was the wrong uh, chapter. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse number. Uh, I'm in verse 11. Philippians 4, verse 11, the Bible says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state that I, the state I am therewith to be content. Now, I will, uh, I will point out that at this time, Paul was in prison. And, and, he, and he made this statement. He says, I'm not speaking of want. And you know what? I, I don't know exactly what they fed in prison back then, but I bet it wasn't good. It was a Roman prison, and I bet they didn't have three hots and a cot like they do today. And he says, I'm not speaking out of want. And you know, there, there's a huge difference between want and need. You know what? I bet he wanted some of that good uh, food that he grew up on. And he's probably getting cold bread at the best. Maybe a cup of water. And it says, I don't, I'm not wanting anything. You know what? You and I, every one of us would be wanting more than we had. But somehow, in all this strife, Paul had learned to be content, to be happy, to be satisfied in what that he had. Verse 12. And I, and I know both how to be abased, bring himself down, humble himself before the Lord. I, both, I know both how to be abased, and I know how to, back to abound. He had experienced success. Ever whence in all things, I am instructed both to, be, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Now, I want you to see that Paul's instruction was this, be satisfied in both. Now, you know, we often make the statement, I'm hungry. Now, what that really is, is you want something to eat. We've never really been hungry, have we? We think we have, and we think, well, I've suffered this. No, you haven't. But, you know, even in the hungry, and your belly gets to grumbling, and, and, and you know, it gets to the point that's about all you think about, could you be content with that? It'd be hard. But I bet if we relied on the Lord, He would give us strength, that He, that he would give, get us through it. And so we find that Paul says, I've done both. 
And I've learned to be content with whatever situation that God puts before me. Then he says in verse 3, 13, after saying, I'm content, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, probably one of the most simple Bible verses that most of us had it memorized by the time we were about six or eight. But, did you know it in context? Because he, he just said, hey, I've been hungry and I'm content. I, I have been full and I'm content. And I can do all things, not, not saying, oh, I can jump over the building and I can do this and I can do that. What he was saying was this, is that I am satisfied, I am content in whatever place he puts me. Yeah. And, I, and, and I can do all things. In other words, if he says you have cancer, he can give you the grace to be content with cancer. If he said, if he said, you know, this morning, and I won't get too deep into it, but they don't have a TV anyway. Uh, uh, one of Donna's people that she delivered, um, the check bounced. <laughs> you know, um, you got to be content, don't you? I mean, her was trying to figure out her checking account to be sure we wouldn't start bouncing too. And, uh, but it, it's, it's hard to be content like that. It would be easy to fall toward the wind. Uh, just be content. You know where most of our anxiety comes from? Not being content. It really does. You know, uh, I would really like to do this. Uh, after the first year, I'd love to do a Christian financing class for the church and for the community. But you always have to start with this. With food and raiment, be there with content. Now, our flesh fights that as hard as it possibly can. And you know, you think about what, do, what does that leave out that we think we all have to have? Food and raiment. And I like my double wide. Right? We think we have to have a home, right? Mm -hmm. But do we really? Not according to the scriptures. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that we need to learn contentment by experience. We need to learn contentment uh, so that we can serve the Lord in a great better way. See, if we're not so worried about what the world has to offer, we can find contentment in Jesus Christ. We can find contentment in the plan that he has for our lives and not necessarily the plan that we have for our own. That is real contentment. And you don't find that in very, very few people. First Timothy. First Timothy chapter one. I mean, excuse me, first Timothy chapter six, verse six. First Timothy chapter six, verse six. The Bible says this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, godliness, and I believe to project the person of Christ. Uh, first and foremost, to be godly, you have to be saved. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, are you, are you content exactly how things are? You know, it has to get discouraging sometimes with what, maybe, maybe 15 of us uh, meeting together on the Lord's Day. You know what that is? It's your contentment problem. Years ago, me and, me and Donna went up uh, to a church in Paducah. It's not Faith Baptist Church at Paducah. There's another independent, uh, sound, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church in Paducah as well. And we went in there, and, you know, it was one of those things. I mean, it's you know, a rough part of Paducah. I'm thinking, Lord, I don't know what we got into now. The gate was locked when we got there. That's how rough part of Paducah it was. And I thought, I've got all my babies out here. <laughs> We're going to get knocked in the head. And we pulled in, and the pastor met us. And very nice man. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. And we got in. And you think this thing sounds like crickets. This was a building that set 
hundred people. And the church had 12 people there and me and Don and the kids. I mean, literally pews. I mean, they sat all in a little place about like this. And pews went on for miles. Nobody sat on this side. And uh, you know what, though? What we found? They were a very content people. They, they were okay with that. And we as the Lord's people, if we could grab a hold of that and be content with such as you have, then we would be a happy people all the time. Now notice, uh, notice if you will, in verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. In other words, you were born with a body... <coughs> And the best you're going to do is be buried in a box out here with a few, uh, with some clothes on. And, you know, whatever you have, what little dab of money you have, you let your young and spite over it. And it really don't matter, does it? It really doesn't matter. When I, so if we could look at our end time, I think we would focus a lot less and we'd be contented. You know, this is what I found working in hospice. And, you know, everybody thinks hospice, they, they go, they've been battling this illness for a long, long time. Usually that's true. But I've had patients that didn't only know they had cancer for two weeks. And they were already in hospice, and they were very, very near death. You know how they were contented with their family around them? Mm -hmm. I, I've, worked, I've worked hospices, hospice cases, and I thought the trailer was going to fall in when I walked in. Very contented people. Going to miss their daddy so bad. You know, we need to be like that, do we not? We, we just need to be content. And if we would look at things in time and eternity, instead of the right here and the right now, I believe contentment would spread through God's people. Now, verse 8 says, And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Very, very difficult thing to do. Last verse I'm going to read for you this morning, and we're going to dismiss Hebrews, Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Uh, let your conversation or your behavior or how you present, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things if you have. Now, uh, the next time you go somewhere, maybe you, you run by First Baptist up there and they were doing something else to their building the other day. I was like, I didn't think you needed anything bigger than that. You know, you could look at that and say, man, I wish I was there. You know what that says? It says you're discontented. It says that you're not happy with what the Lord is giving you. You're not happy where you're at. And, and what that will all build up within us, and it makes us to do things that really we don't want to do, go into debt and, and anything else just to be content. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. So when the food is gone, now I want you to see that verse didn't say that he was going to provide it. He said that we needed to be content. Uh, if the food is gone, if the electricity is shut off, if you don't have anything else, you know what it's time to do? It's time to be content. But what do we do? Oh, maybe Junior, that's uh, his daughter I married over 30 years ago. He'll get our water put back on. And, and I know Mama's got a little bit of money. She'll buy us something to eat. Just be content. Is God God or is he not? We need to learn to be content. And I'll guarantee you, if you truly attain contentment, most peaceful feeling you'll ever have. Knowing what you have is exactly what God wants you to have. And just be happy with it.